Good evening, uh, members of the Harris School, the Greater University of Chicago community, friends, guests. As commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health and as an alumna of Harris's Civic Leadership Academy, it's my great honor to welcome you all virtually to tonight's public event, recognizing Dr. Anthony Fauci for his contribution to evidence-based policy as the 2020 Harris Dean's Award recipient. The Harris Dean's Award is bestowed upon an exceptional leader for his or her lifetime contributions to public policy. Exemplifying the mission of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy, recipients of the Harris Dean's Award have championed analytically rigorous, evidence-based approaches to policy and serve as an inspiration to the next generation of policy leaders and scholars working to address the world's most important challenges. So tonight's guest of honor clearly needs no introduction. Uh, Dr. Fauci is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He's also the chief medical advisor on, on COVID-19 to President Biden. But Dr. Fauci has been known in the infectious disease world literally for decades. He served presidents from Reagan to Biden did groundbreaking work on HIV and AIDS, and literally wrote the textbook that uh, I learned from in medical school uh, related to infectious diseases. Also, I think the U.S. has come to know him in a lot of ways during this current pandemic. Uh, real commitment to data and evidence and public health and the national discourse. Uh, and I personally have had some opportunity to get to know him because he has got to be one of the busiest people on the planet. And yet he's been making time in the evenings, really every other week for this whole pandemic to talk to folks on the ground uh, in cities like me in red states and blue states, really wanting to get the unvarnished uh, details about what is happening related to COVID. And I've really, really appreciated uh, that opportunity to talk um, and really appreciated uh, Dr. Fauci's interest in actually understanding what the facts are uh, and digging down underneath the surface. This focus on science, uh, focus on equity, and the work you know, really taking this approach is what I try to do in my role at CDPH. When I was in the Civic Leadership Academy, lots of lots of information about thinking how can you be a better leader and I think the lesson of not just taking things for granted wanting to take the time to get all the way down to the people who are on the ground trying to implement the policies um, is a lesson that I learned in CLA and one that I think Dr. Fauci has really exemplified. Evidence-based policy making uh, in conjunction to the pandemic is certainly something we've tried to do here in Chicago. Uh, we make all of our decisions based on data and I think it's reflective of Harris and the, and the University of Chicago's commitment broadly to following where the science and data leads us. I'm also so excited uh, uh, to have the opportunity to introduce Dean Catherine Baker. She's an outstanding and really a very logical choice to be able to present Dr. Fauci with this award. Uh, Dean Baker, as many of you know, is a champion of evidence-based policy and a leading health economist. She's really well suited to interview Dr. Fauci about his life, career, and commitment to public health and to present him with the Harris Dean's Award. Uh, Dr. Baker's research focuses primarily on the factors that drive the distribution, generosity, and effectiveness of public and private health insurance with a particular focus on the effect of health system reform. So a lot of people have been thinking a lot about the health system and ways we could reform it uh, in the conversation related to COVID. She's also deeply engaged in the policy sphere. She's served on, um, she serves on numerous boards and advisory bodies, including the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Social Insurance, the Congressional Budget Office's Panel of Health Advisors, the Advisory Board of the National Institute for Healthcare Management. So I really want to express my deep appreciation uh, for the opportunity to have had the you know to have had the chance to really interact with both of you uh, at different points in my life um, seeing what wonderful opportunities uh, you have you have really brought um, and new conversations related to public health uh, I, I love seeing leaders whose personalities also become something that people connect to and I'm really looking forward to this conversation between Dean Baker uh, and the illustrious dr. fauci and with that, um, I'll hand it over to Dr. Baker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. It's such an honor to have you as an alum of CLA and to introduce this panel. And we're so grateful for all of your engagement and most of all for helping to keep us all safe in the city of Chicago. We are so grateful for all of your work and so proud to call you an alum. 
Now, Dr. Fauci, it is an enormous honor for me to be able to bestow this Dean's Award on you this year. As a health economist, I am a huge fan, so it's a personal thrill as well, but you're an inspiration to all of our students, our faculty, our alums, our Harris community about what an evidence-based policy champion can accomplish always, but particularly in a time of crisis. Your public service dedication is a beacon for all of our students who are aiming to go into public service in a world where they can make a difference by bringing these skills to bear and having you speak tonight is a thrill for all of us. And I'm gonna get straight to the questions because there's so many things that we would love to hear you discuss, but I would like to present you virtually with this year's award. I believe you have it in hand. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very I wish much. Wonderful honor, really, very much so. Thank you. Well, we are so grateful that you're spending this time with us. We wish that we could be with you in person at the beautiful Keller Center, uh, but you have also been such an important champion and voice for safety and wisdom in keeping our distance from each other. And that is an important lesson that we take very seriously at the university and in the city. So maybe sometime we'll all be able to be together in person, but this is a wonderful opportunity for people from around the globe to be able to join and that wouldn't be possible in person. So there are some advantages to the virtual medium as well. So with that, I would love to turn to asking you some questions. I have some questions of my own, but I also have questions that have been submitted from our Harris community, from students, alumni, faculty. I will weave those in as well. Um, as you've heard, the Harris School and the University of Chicago are particularly dedicated to evidence-based policy and analytical approaches. It's been a challenging year for evidence-based policy. And I wanna start by asking you a little bit about what we've learned over the last year. What does the evidence say? What have we learned since almost a year ago when the pandemic was declared about the disease? One of our students uh, noted that we may have been misinformed by prior experiences with pandemics when the virus looks different. So what's the state of our knowledge about the virus and in the clinic and how we ought to be handling this particular pandemic? Well, thank you very much for that question. It's, um, it's a very relevant question. And one of the questions that your own students asked, I think is really right at the bottom of all of this. So it's been about a year now that we really appreciated what we were getting into with this pandemic that was global in nature, but that has really very, very severely afflicted the United States of America. There were some things, and this gets to the point that you were making, uh, Dean Baker, that we have knowledge that evolves as the weeks and the months go by. And sometimes you need to make policy changes or policy decisions when you have not all the information that you need. And one of the things that this outbreak has taught us that scientific investigation and the collection of data and evidence will almost naturally have you evolve your own stance, opinion, guideline, or what have you. Because when you're dealing with virgin territory and evolving uh, um, uh, epidemic in front of you, you have to make adjustments, be flexible enough and humble enough to know that you may need to essentially modify what you've said before. Some examples, very briefly, that I think are really to the core of the question. When we first were confronted with this virus and we knew that it was a coronavirus, that it was phylogenetically very similar to the original SARS, which is now renamed SARS-CoV-1 because this is SARS-CoV-2, there was a reasonable assumption together with the information that we were getting from the Chinese, that this is very much like the original SARS. But some of the fundamental characteristics that were different were really game changers in this uh, particular pandemic. First of all, the fact that this virus is spectacularly capable in transmitting from human to human, number one. Number two, unlike any virus that I've had any experience with, about 30 to 40, 45% of people never get any symptoms at all. 
So whenever have you seen a virus in which almost half the people get no symptoms, and yet it can kill a half a million Americans thus far, and a couple of million more plus globally. That's almost a dichotomy there. But the real showstopper for us that slapped us into a recognition into what we were really dealing with is that anywhere between 50 to 60% of all transmissions occur from someone who will either never get any symptoms or is pre-symptomatic, which means they are transmitting it before they have manifestations of disease. And that's just not the way respiratory viruses have worked historically. There have been some situations where maybe a day before you get symptoms, you can transmit, but the bulk of the transmission is driven by people who are, who are symptomatic. That is absolutely not the case here, which complicates everything from an appreciation of why you should be always wearing a mask, which is com completely complicates identification, isolation, and contact tracing. So as we've learned over the year, we've been faced with something that is a very, very confounding virus. That's the, I would say, the very sobering part and the humiliating part, <laughs> the things that have made us very humble about this is what this virus has taught us. It's been a very painful learning experience. Well, as you highlight, that makes it awfully hard to communicate both to the public and to policymakers recommendations that are evolving over time, but that don't then undermine public trust in the advice that they're hearing. How do you think about threading the needle between conveying certainty, enough certainty that people will feel comfortable following recommendations with enough uncertainty that you're realistically conveying what we know and that the advice might change? Well, what I think it is, I don't know whether this comes with uh, experience, age, or naturally, or a combination of both. You have to have enough, I would say, a combination of confidence in yourself, um, but also um, flexibility and humility to be able to tell the public without feeling that you're showing that you may have a deficiency that you do not know. It is impossible to know everything at the outset. So one of the, you know, one of the several lessons that I've learned is first of all, don't guess. <laughs> you know, keep the foundation of what you do on data. And when you don't have the data, make it very explicit so that no one gets any misinterpretation that you are saying something that is possible, maybe likely, but you do not know for sure. Now, one of the problems with the, uh, I guess this gets into the social media uh, issue, which confounds things, is that Often something is taken out of its contextual concept, context. So you say something and it's taken completely out of context. And one of the classic things are that we feel we likely should be doing this. However, we are waiting for the full data to be able to make a decision. The sound bite will be, we said this in January, now it's March, things have changed, you're flip-flopping. It's not flip-flopping, it's the accumulation of data and making decisions, guidelines, recommendations according to the data that you have at the time. And you should be flexible enough and humble enough to know that in fact, you've got to go with the data that you have. And if that means changing something that you said, you should not feel badly or even guilty about having to do that, as long as the science drives what you say. It's not flip-flopping, it's learning. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what data do you wish that you'd had? If we're thinking about doing even better the next time around, 
what data collection systems do you think we should have in place in terms of population surveillance, in terms of you know, bringing together data from multiple sources across the country? What do you wish you'd known sooner and what infrastructure do we need to know it for next time? Oh yeah, I think what we really do need to do is strengthen the local health systems to be able to do things on the ground and see them as they evolve. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to do from the very beginning was to flood the system with testing, even if it was not as sensitive as true PCR testing, but antigen testing to just get a feel for what it is under the radar screen. You know, there are people always ask me for similarities with my multi-decade experience with HIV AIDS. There are some similarities, but a lot of differences. One of the similarities that I tell students and fellows is that there's this concept of the tip of the iceberg. If you're only looking for people who are really sick and you have a disease that either has a long incubation period in the sense of clinical incubation, not virological incubation, but if it takes a long period of time, by the time someone gets sick, it represents the tip of the iceberg who's really infected. That's what happened with HIV. Because before we identified the virus, before we had sensitive tests for someone being infected or not, we thought the only people who had HIV or the only people who had AIDS were people who were very sick and I and others were in the midst of taking care of a lot of them. Little did we realize that below the radar screen were multi, multi, multi times the number of people who were infected but were not yet sick. And they were spreading the infection inadvertently and in a very, very low below the radar screen manner. Here, when you have a situation when you see very, very sick patients and you don't know that there are people under the radar screen who are never getting ill, who are spreading it. When you see people who are sick, you're seeing the tip of the iceberg of the extent of the outbreak. That's just one thing that is very similar four decades later. And there are several things. I mean, I mean if we had known early on that the community spread was A, real, and B, inevitable if you didn't screen very intensively the asymptomatic cohort in the population. If we had known that, I believe things would have done very differently. Not, not to mention things that got in the way of everything we did was the fact that we were fighting an epidemic in the middle of one of the most divisive periods in the history of, uh, at least in recent memory, you know, maybe a hundred or so, 200 years ago, there was more divisiveness in the country, certainly during the civil war, but this is coming close where you have public health measures that are assuming almost a political stance, whether or not you should wear a mask, whether or not you should avoid congregate setting, that makes it extremely difficult to address a pandemic of this proportion. There are so many threads I want to pick up on in that answer. Uh, one of the first one maybe I'll turn to is following up on the similarities and differences between this pandemic and the AIDS HIV epidemic. In each of those cases, the populations who were affected looked very different. We've seen wild disparities in access to healthcare and underlying health conditions in prevalence of the disease, in access to care conditional on getting the disease across the US and in Chicago with this pandemic. The population hit by AIDS was not representative of the overall US population, especially at first. How does who bears the burden of the disease play out into that landscape of political support or divisiveness and your ability to recommend and have implemented best public health practices? Well, that's an absolutely critical issue that you bring up, Dean Baker. 
it, it's it's a, you know extraordinary when you have uh, selective uh, segments of the population have a disease, uh, and that gets to those almost eerie similarities and differences between the two. You know, and having uh, lived through both, it, it's something that's in, in really embedded in my consciousness. So go back a few decades and you have the people who are the ones who are the vulnerable ones to infection are a segment of society that unfortunately had been disenfranchised for so many reasons of stigma. So you have the general population that should have been galvanized from the beginning against this terribly deadly disease, which has already killed about 38 million people worldwide, that early on at least, there wasn't that overwhelming enthusiasm on the part of the nation to address this. And God bless them, they did so well. The activist shook up the cages here, including me, and got me to be very, very cognizant of what they needed if we were going to address this outbreak in a meaningful way. Now, turn the page over and look at COVID-19. It is striking that the people who are the ones who likely are spreading the infection inadvertently, and I would say innocently, because I don't think people are doing anything maliciously, don't really care about getting infected. It's the pictures of the bars of people falling all over each other, offering, you know, ordering a drink or going in enclosed uh, settings with no masks or saying, I don't wanna abide by public health measures. I wanna just go back and live my life do my thing, do whatever I want to do, because quantitatively and statistically, those aren't the ones that are going into intensive care, are dying and accounting for the half a million. So you have one segment of the population that's driving an outbreak that's killing another segment of the population. And it isn't any, there's no guilt there. It just happens to be the way it is because young, healthy people, generally, if you look at the curve of hospitalizations per 100,000, it's totally weighted very heavily to the people who are the elderly. In fact, there's a overwhelming percentage of the deaths are among people who are elderly. And then obviously people who have underlying conditions with a lot of overlap between age and underlying conditions, which is just natural in the human species. Now, obviously, you're going to have some younger people who have the underlying conditions that lead to serious disease and deaths. But statistically, it's relatively minuscule compared to the elderly with the underlying conditions. So that's a very difficult messaging issue here. So how do you get people to care about not being part of the propagation of an outbreak that almost certainly will not affect them in a serious way, but has a devastating impact on morbidity and mortality of other people? That is really a very interesting phenomenon that I'm sure when we get out from this, there are people who are gonna do a lot of uh, analysis of that with treatises and books and all kinds of things. You can be sure of that. We're still studying the 1917 pandemic, the flu pandemic, and I'm sure you're right that we will be studying this for decades to come. Uh, you, you highlight some of the trade-offs involved that policymakers and public health officials have to wrestle with in a world of scarce resources. Right now, vaccine supplies are short, although we all very much hope that that is easing up very soon. But different 
officials at the state and local and national level are making different choices about how to prioritize populations for the vaccines. Several of the questions we got from staff and faculty and students highlighted some of those trade-offs, thinking about a 65-year-old community-dwelling retiree versus a 63-year-old person working out in the community and having more interactions, thinking about young people who might be disproportionate spreaders of the disease versus older people who were the disproportionate victims of the health consequences. How do you think about those trade-offs in prioritizing populations to be first in line for the vaccine? And who do you think should be making those decisions? Should it be a uniform national set of priorities or should there be a lot of flexibility jurisdiction jurisdiction? Well, the nature of our nation as you well know, probably better than I, is that there have been this issue that dates back to the founding fathers, that you have a strong federal government, but you have what I, you know, I was actually very interesting, not to change subject in the middle of a sentence, but I was speaking today on a Zoom call with a very high ranking health official from a European country, very bright person. And we try to explain the differences of what happened in his country versus what happened in here. And I said, the one thing that you've got to know of the difference between your country and my country is that your country is like a single unit. My country is the United States of America. And we're not fooling around when we say states, because the federalist approach is that you have a federal government that can provide resources and do the kinds of things, but you leave as an extraordinary amount of discretion and in some to the states. And in some situations, that's the beauty of our country, because we are so diverse geographically, culturally, um, uh, weather-wise, uh, I mean, uh, everything is different. So it's appropriate to give a great deal of flexibility to the states. The only thing that all of a sudden you come face to face with is that when you have a common enemy and the common enemy is the virus, and the virus doesn't know very much the difference between Louisiana and Mississippi or between New York and New Jersey, or between Idaho and Montana, that you've got to do some things that are really uniform. And that was one of the things that actually was the weakness in our response. Uh, I'll get to the vaccine distribution in a moment, but that is one of the things that we had a problem with because we wanted to all pull together. And yet some states often related to their ideology of whether it was a red state or a blue state, which almost inherently is wrong because you're dealing with a single common enemy and you wanna get a certain set of guidelines that you do so that everybody's pulling together. Then you get the situation where you leave up to the locals what their priority will be. Um, there is a great deal of reluctance and pushback of the central government saying this is what you must do. So what the central government does, it makes recommendations based on things like the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which over the years has done a pretty good job on giving prioritization when you have a vaccine that's either in short supply or a vaccine that has certain characteristics that they would say, from what we know about epidemiology, it's important to vaccinate this group because they are the spreaders or this group because they are the most vulnerable. Just like every year, we get those recommendations from the CDC with influenza when they say, you want to vaccinate the children and the elderly and pregnant women, et cetera. It's good to have a central group 
who has experience in making those recommendations. But then when you get the locals who have maybe a different idea, understandably different, then you have a lot of different disparities. You have one state doing it this way and one state doing it that way. There's a positive aspect of that because they know better for their state. But often there may be other motives of doing that with influences that are not necessarily directed towards the public health, but more towards influence that if you have a little influence, you'll get it first. One of the things that we've learned from this outbreak, which again has some analogies to, to HIV, is the extraordinary health disparities that we have in this country for our minority populations, for our brown and black populations. You know, again, going back to the experience with HIV, 13% of the population is African American, 44% of all the new infections are. African American. Of those 65% are men who have sex with men. Of those 75% are people who are young, who are 18 to 49 or what have you. You go fast forward to COVID-19 and you see discrepancies that are stunning. That you have brown and black people by the nature of the jobs they have, that they're essential workers keeping the country going. They're interfacing with people. They're not talking to a computer person the way you and I are talking to each other safely in wherever we are. So they're out there and they have a higher incidence of infection. Then what they have is a much higher incidence and prevalence of the comorbidities that put them into that category at whatever age they are of having a serious outcome of hospitalization and deaths. If you look at the bar graphs of hospitalizations of Native Americans, Alaskan Indians, uh, Hispanics and African Americans, the bar graph goes out here, whites it's here. Multifold increased per 100,000 people in the hospital. With deaths, it's the same thing. It's a few fold, two or three fold more. The reason for that is a variety of causes. One of them that's so prevalent is the social determinants of health, that we're not going to change overnight, that we've got to make a commitment now of what we're going to do for the next few decades, so that there's no racial prevalence of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, kidney disease. It's how you were brought up, the diet you have, the poverty conditions that you were brought up. It's the lack of access to good medical care. So, you know, I always say that, and I, I kind of use any time I get a chance to say it as the, as the bully pulpit of, we can't let this be forgotten when we get out of COVID-19. We've got to remember the health disparities that keeps coming back and biting the populations that are the most vulnerable. Regarding vaccine, getting back to your question, you know, you do want to leave it to the, to the local groups to, if they fairly do it, if they say in our community, it's important to protect these people because they're doing certain things. I'm giving you a, a typical example. You have 1A, which is healthcare providers, obviously. I mean, they're the ones that are the heroes and heroines every day putting them on the line. That's one. And then you have individuals who are the uh, most vulnerable. You have the elderly, the most vulnerable. Then you have a situation where when you get to the people who are in essential jobs, what's an essential job. I mean, that's the thing. We are now putting teachers high on the list of essential jobs. And the reason for that is the importance of getting the kids back to school. And we know that the teacher's concern about getting infected is one of the reasons why the schools 
don't open. I don't think teachers, there should be a sine qua non that unless you're vaccinated, you shouldn't go back to school, but teachers should be prioritized because they are a very, very important part of the population. There's arguments saying, should you be prioritizing people on the basis of their race? Namely, if African-Americans and Latinx are ones who clearly are bearing the burden, then you get into a slippery slope about race. So there's arguments that go on all the time. So what you'd like to say is that let's get the people who are the essential workers that maybe you want to add the vulnerable among them. And we know that many of the minority population are vulnerable. I went on a little bit longer than I wanted to, but this is the conversation that we have every single day. Well, I want to ask you to elaborate even further on the crucial point you raised about the disparities in pre-existing conditions, in vulnerability to the consequences of getting COVID. Of course, there are parallel tragic disparities in economic circumstances for the people who are you know, most likely to be hit by a recession, least likely to be able to sit comfortably at home, safely at home and continue to get paid. Are those same black and brown populations who have the greater health burden to begin with and are then more exposed both to the physical consequences and to the economic consequences of the current situation, they're also less likely to be vaccinated. There are lower distribution rates and lower take up rates. What messages or strategies do you think that we can do to increase access to and successful administration of vaccines among these very vulnerable populations? Well, now you've asked a question that I could actually answer with some, con <laughs> with some concrete uh, information. So this is something that we've discussed in great detail and President Biden has made a very, very strong commitment of equity. That is critical and everything that we talk about and we do this every day with the medical team that's led by Jeff Zients. And what we do is we say, we've got to do these things, but it's got to be equity. So what actually in a concrete way has been done? It's the putting up of community vaccine centers, about 440 of them with a clear recognition that we've got to put them geographically into those areas where the demography is heavily weighted towards minority populations. You can't have it in places that are completely inaccessible. Number two, you've got to put a lot of vaccine in pharmacies including pharmacies in areas, again, that serve minority populations. Thirdly, you've got to have a situation where you use mobile units to get into relatively inaccessible, underserved uh, situations. You know, I, I've, I've got to tell you, the reason I, I get more humble as the years go by, because I realize how much I don't know. and even though I thought I did know a lot about the access of minority populations, when you go deep down, you realize that some of them are in situations where they're in deserts, uh, deserts of pharmacy deserts, food store deserts, healthcare deserts. They don't have a car to get to where they need to be. They don't have a computer to sign up for something. You know, all of those things that you've really got to realize that are there and you say, yeah, yeah, I should have, I should have really figured that out. And that's the reason why you've got to extend yourself. In order to make that happen is that the president has also established an equity task force with people who are full-time doing this, as well as a chair of the task force, uh, uh, Marcella Nunes Smith, uh, who is actually not full-time, part-time, she's at Yale, but that's one of the things she's done. Cameron Webb and a bunch of other people who think about this all the time. Bottom line is it's a really high priority that we put equity into the implementation of these programs, whether it be vaccine, whether it be healthcare, whether it be treatments when they become available, it's gotta be done in an equitable manner. 
So you mentioned as well the importance of resourcing localities, particularly those who serve underserved populations, but local public health infrastructure for surveillance and distribution and the variation in local conditions that cities and states have to deal with. At the same time, we've seen distribution challenges, shortages, particularly early on, ranging from PPE to therapeutics to vaccines. If you got to command and control resources at a national level, where do you think the choke points were that we could alleviate with a different distribution or production strategy? And how would you like to see that change? Well, I hope that we have enough corporate memory to remember what we had to do. Uh, and I remember it because I was sitting in the situation room of the White House every single day, you know, saying, oh my God, how are we, how are we gonna get out of this? To know that we have our people, you know, people like the, the brave and heroic people in Chicago. I know about that because Allison was be telling me about that all the time when we were meeting about the lack of PPE, the lack of the, the proper equipment that you need to perform your functions safely. Then you find out that most of it is made in another country. So we wound up having to get the military to fly these cargo planes back and forth. And you're sitting there saying, you're kidding me. We actually have to have it flown in to then distribute. So we want to talk about things that we can make ourselves, that we don't have to rely on other countries who might have the same problem we have. That's one of the things about pandemics. To think if you're relying on supplies from out of the country, but you're dealing with a global pandemic, why do you think that the countries that have to take care of themselves are gonna put you before them? And understandably, they don't. So one of the lessons is we've gotta be much more self-sufficient. That's for sure. So that's, I think, one of the top lessons that we want to learn. The other thing is, again, one of the things that we were in discussion with Allison and her colleagues on our Tuesday evening discussions is that the infrastructure at the local public health area has almost been a victim of our own success. It was really strong decades ago when you needed it for the local care of tuberculosis and sexually transmitted diseases. Then we get a lot of technologies, a lot of vaccinology, we get you know, good interventions, and the local kind of attrited a way that some of them are not equipped with 21st century, not even 20th century <laughs> capabilities, still using fax machines and things like that, lack of the ability to do things electronically, that's gotta be fixed. I mean, if you're looking at what happens in the future for future outbreaks. So let's spend our last 15 minutes talking about the future. I know that we are all hoping that there is such a thing as a post-pandemic world, um, but is that the right way to be thinking about things? Are we going to you know, get over the pandemic once everybody's vaccinated, or are we going to be living in a world where we are constantly fighting variants, delivering booster shots, tweaking vaccines, uh, and this is just gonna be something we worry about all the time, but hopefully at a lower grade level. Okay, so this gets to my, what I mentioned to you a bit ago of being honest and humble. I don't know the answer to that question. I just don't. And the reason I don't is that there are too many variables in there that I don't have control over, nor do my public health colleagues have control over. In a perfect world, you would get everybody or almost everybody vaccinated. I've estimated that the level of herd immunity for a virus with this degree of transmissibility and with the efficacy of vaccines being 95, 94%, that you would need maybe 70 to 85% of the population to either be vaccinated or to be uh, having already been infected. Uh, one of the sad and alarming things we've learned 
is that when you get variants like the ones we're tracking in South Africa, you get infected with the wild type virus and you recover and you find out that the variant, you're not protected against the variant with pre-infection. You're likely more protected with the vaccine, but not with that. So that's a variable that says constantly getting asked, well, when are we gonna get back to normal? Is it gonna be September? It's gonna be November? It's gonna be the end of the year? We don't know because there are variables. How many people are gonna get vaccinated? How many variants are you gonna have? And then you get to the thing that we really don't have individually a lot of control over. And that is a global pandemic requires a global response. So we could do everything we need to do for the United States. The European Union can do it for the European Union and the UK, but there will be parts of the world unless we address the response as a global response. We could have variants coming back and forth. And just when you think you have everything under control because there's a disease that's raging in Africa, in Asia, in South America, in the, the Caribbean. And then all of a sudden you wind up reseeding your population with a really troublesome variant. So that's the reason why I've already begun to talk about it, there is never as much interest when you're struggling in your own country. But once you start to get things under control, you realize how vulnerable you are for it to get out of control if you don't address this as a global pandemic. In fact, that was one of the things I was speaking with today with my colleague from the European Union about we all agree that we've got to treat it as you know one planet, not you know 185 countries or whatever it is that we have. One planet that's really got to look at this pandemic in the same way. Well, that suggests the need for ongoing vigilance and and proactive addressing of the variants by policymakers and public health officials. It also suggests ongoing caution and care at the individual level that. Uh, even people who have been vaccinated uh, were learning should still exert some caution, should still be limiting activities. That's a tough message for people to hear at the end of all of this pandemic fatigue and with the, the vaccine on the horizon that's been billed as the thing that's going to save us all, which in many, many ways it will. How do, how do you think that contributes to people's willingness to get the vaccine and how in a humble way should we be communicating about the upside of getting the vaccine and keeping you safe and letting you resume some activities, but the need to maintain caution and limitations in what you do? How do you talk to people about that? Were you on the phone call that I was on today with the White House? I'm always <laughs> listening. You think I'm not, but I'm always there. No, I mean, that's an extraordinarily relevant question because it becomes a messaging issue. The, the, the instinct is to say we have a really good vaccine. I'm vaccinated. I got a 95% effective vaccine. Why can't I do whatever I want to do? Well, the reason is ultimately you may be able to do that, but not right now because there are things we don't know. The primary endpoint of the vaccine trial was clinically recognizable disease. We don't know yet whether or not it prevents you from getting infected where you're not with symptoms, you're asymptomatic, but you have virus in your nasopharynx that you could then infect an unvaccinated person who might be vulnerable and you will inadvertently and innocently get them sick. So we say, you've got to wear a mask. People say, why do I got to wear a mask? Why did I get vaccinated? You got vaccinated to preserve your health, the health of the family, and to help to crush the dynamics of the outbreak. When we find out whether or not people who are vaccinated have such a low level of infection, of, 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 of viral titer, if they get a breakthrough infection, so likely you're gonna cut down not only on symptomatic infection, but on asymptomatic infection. We don't know that yet. I think it will be the case 
And I think also, again, I think, I don't know. <laughs> I think also that if you do get a breakthrough infection and you're vaccinated, that the level of virus in your nasopharynx will be substantially lower than the level of virus in an asymptomatic person who wasn't vaccinated. There's a study from Israel that strongly suggests that, but we're doing a study now to try and nail that down. And if in fact we find that out, then you're gonna see a pulling back on some of the restrictions, but we're not there yet. And when we get there, then you'll see changes in regulations, but not quite yet. So can I ask you for a little bit more information on a study like that? What kind of data do you need to collect from whom to be able to learn about that risk of infection of other people among vaccinated folks? There's the indirect way and there's the direct way. The indirect way is the one that I just mentioned. You can make a reasonable assumption that if the level of virus in the nasopharynx of a breakthrough infection from someone who's vaccinated is dramatically lower than in the other individual who was not vaccinated, I think you could make a reasonable assumption that the risk of transmission, just like we proved with HIV, and it took years, you know, the HIV undetectable equals untransmissible, you may not know that as an economist, but, but it's true, is that if the level goes below a certain level, you just don't transmit it. So it may be that we will show that if the level of virus in your nasopharynx, because you're vaccinated, is so low that you don't have to worry about transmitting, that's gonna be a game changer for what a vaccinated person can or cannot do. The way you do it directly is you do a cohort study where you, for example, vaccinate people in a closed group. Best way to do that, college campuses with dorms. You, you vaccinate people and anybody that gets infected, you do sequencing of the virus and you find out that does a person who is vaccinated, who gets infected, is that the virus that transmits it to the uninfected placebo group? Or is it only the un, excuse me, the unvaccinated placebo group? Or is it only the unvaccinated transmitting it to each other? If there's no transmission from the vaccinated group, that's it. That's your study and you're in good shape. So I wanna ask you with, I wanna leave with one more question, forward looking. What are you most looking forward to doing in this post-COVID world, whatever that looks like, that you haven't been able to do for the last year? Well, um, I think it's reconnecting with society. Um, you know, I believe that, you know, when, when you have multiple vaccinated people and you're in the confines of your home, you know, I feel was safe and giving my daughters a hug and things like that. But I'm talking beyond that. I'm talking about reconnecting with society. It's been quite surrealistic, the existence that we've lived right now. It's just, um, I'm wondering how long it's gonna take us to reacclimate to being social beings in a physical way with each other. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I'm looking forward to a number of simple things like my wife and I, when we like to come home, we, you know, she works with me at the NIH. Sometimes we get home very late. We go to a really nice, pleasant bar restaurant up the block. We know the owners, we know the people, we sit down, we have a beer, we have a hamburger and we come home and we go to bed. Uh, we haven't done that in a year. I mean, that is just, that's part of the fun of natural living that is interacting with society. Well, uh, that sounds like something that you have more than earned. And I know it's a sentiment shared by so many people is the, the eagerness to return to 
three-dimensional human interaction and to be able to gather in person. I am so grateful though, that at the end of what I'm sure, or probably the middle for you of a very, very long day, you were willing to take this time to be with us and to share some of the many insights that you've developed, your um, insights about how policymakers can draw on evidence what it is that we do know and don't know, how to talk with humility about where we have certainty and where we don't, and how to let the evidence drive our policy making. Um, it's of vital importance. I know it's saved so many lives already, and that it's an inspiration to all of our students, our alums, our faculty, our staff, the whole Harris community, and people around the world. So I'm so grateful to you for taking the time. So honored to have you as our 2020 Harris Dean's Award recipient. And I hope that you get that burger and beer around the corner very, very soon. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to the thousands of people around the world who participated in this conversation. It'll be available online afterwards. It's been such an honor for me to get to talk with you. Maybe I'll even get to join you for beer and burger sometime in your neighborhood. Thank you so much for being with us and thank you for all that you do for our world. Thank you very much, Steve Baker. And it's a real pleasure to have been with you. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for this wonderful award. I will cherish Display with pride. <laughs> I will. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.